good talent pipeline. Yeah, yeah. Impact. It's, it's it's your early careers. It's your diversity. It's your uh, in demand talent. It's your exec hiring, and it, internal a a really good talent pipeline solves pretty much everything. Yeah, I, I, I think. Do you all agree, folks? I mean, is that is that the the the, the one solution, the one answer to all recruitment issues? Just have a talent pipeline. Um, of course, you know that that is what Adam Gordon would say, either on screen or off screen, because that's yeah. his cliche. That's yeah, but I'm not. Too. I'm not selling it. I'm not selling anything to do with it. And I, you know, <laughs> it it's just, I'm just proving. I still believe it's, it. It's in your DNA now, Adam. I mean, I think if they actually did some, uh, if they actually did some like molecular analysis as to your DNA, there'd probably be a talent pipeline. Sort it's of just somewhere. right. It is. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> anyway, um, welcome everybody uh, to Brain Food Live on Air. It is um, it is episode 204, bringing it to you every Friday, no fail. Um, uh, today, we're be- I'm very excited to bring this show to you because um, it is a topic that I know the recruiting community is really desperate to have a handle on. And you know why I know this? Um, is because I wrote a post on this a month ago, and it is, I think, certainly the most popular post I've ever written over the last 12 months. And it may be the most popular post ever. Um, that's how significant it is for me. Um, because it's something like you know, 700,000 people viewed it or something, you know, a thousand plus comments, right? So ridiculous amounts of people just into it. Um, and I think it is because there was a cool giveaway, number one. But secondly, I think recruiters, want to know about uh, quality of hire, but they don't know enough about it. They don't know how to operationalize it. They don't know how to implement it, even though I suspect um, it's, a, it's a metric that's now being like prominently pushed um, at TA by C-level. So are you hiring better people for my company? That's what CEOs are saying. Um, and we've got to be able to give a response, folks. Uh, so that is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so I hope you're on the right show. You hope you enjoy yourself as well. Okay, let's do some sound checks real quick just to make sure everyone can hear me okay. Um, we're on live, we're on Crowdcast, folks. So if you're on Crowdcast and you're watching this here, uh, just drop me a quick comment to let me know you can hear me okay. Um, uh, we are also live streaming, and in fact, we are multi streaming across other people's social networks. Would you believe it, folks? I haven't seen anybody else do this. Sooner or later, everyone's gonna do it. Um, but brain food might be first to the market. Um, we have got. Uh, it's live streaming from Adam Gordon's uh, LinkedIn, I believe. So, Adam, if you're if you're a friend of Adam's, one of the one of the five friends of Adam's watching this, um, uh, uh, welcome, welcome to Brain Food Live. Um, we are also live streaming this from uh, Lindsay Shanklin's uh, 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 LinkedIn and also Simon Sapula's as well. There's a guy called Spinks doing it, um, and I believe I believe Chantel is doing it as well. So we've got five people minimum that are live streaming this out. Um, I think about how many brain food is we could actually do this on a Friday, potentially it becomes a, a LinkedIn takeover. Uh, anyway, that, that, that guy called Spinks is probably the company that Chantel works for. It'll be through their <laughs> co- company page, Spinks. I hope so. Maybe it is ex Mortimer Spinks, right? Is that is that part of the Nash brand? I don't know. I mean, maybe it is. It is, I think. So you're yeah. quite right. Um, all right. Um, uh, everyone can hear me okay on link on the LinkedIn's. Drop me a comment on there. Make sure the audio is fine. Let me just make sure that's happening. Uh, yeah, I think Sarge is watching that on LinkedIn. Well, at least one person is watching it on my LinkedIn, at least, so they can hear me okay. Um, all right, cool. Let's do a quick thank you to our sponsors, folks. Uh, we have to thank our sponsors every week because we, without their support, we cannot bring you this conversation. Um, and every week, some company steps up to do it. Uh, no matter what the market conditions, this week, it is Greenhouse again, um, one of the leading ATSs. Um, in the marketplace. They're always featuring in the top right-hand quadrant of the Gartner's sort of uh, best ATSs and what have you. Definitely a product you need to check out if you're looking to upgrade to enterprise class. Um, They've rolled out three new products that you need to check out. Onboarding, pay transparency, and something else which is really cool. You should check them out. I'll share the links into the chat stream. And they're also doing a a webinar series for how to get the best out of these uh, tools um, and how to achieve hiring success. So you absolutely need to check that out as well. So let me just quickly share where the webinar is. Um, so this is me sharing a webinar link to another webinar, but check this out. I think they're running it on a fairly 
um, a kind of bi-weekly cycle. So you don't have to worry about what time it is. Uh, just click on it. And if you're interested in getting some insight as to how uh, to get better at TA and also use a great tool and ma get max value out of it, uh, check that out as well. Okay, uh, let's get on with it. Um, Adam, welcome to the show. Great to see you again, of course. Um, and yeah, we were just talking about the, uh, the the recent event in Excel, right? So quite an exciting one. A new event on the horizon for us in recruitment. Um, what's it called again? HR something? HR Tech? Was it? It was Rather... H <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> HR Technologies Conference, I think it was called. And so um... Lacking in inspiration and titling, aren't we? <laughs> well, it, it's, uh, it was a... Um... It was a kind of side event to the Learning Technologies Conference, and Learning Technologies Conference has been going for a long time, and uh, it was absolutely huge. And of course, in HR, we always think about learning in terms of corporate learning, but I mean, there was like all sorts of interesting companies there, like Synthesia, which creates AI-generated videos and things like that. A lot of consumer tech, and as a result, a lot of very, very cool tech. Um, and Coolest thing you saw? Uh, well, I mean, Synthesia probably you give it, give it, give it some, give it some, give it some information and you've got a two minute video done in like 30 seconds. It's uh very, very good indeed. However, the coolest thing I saw on the HR tech side was I was, uh, I was hosting and then judging part of the, the startup competition and the company that won, I just knew it within two minutes of the pitch starting. I knew this is going to, this is going to win. And, uh, it was called, um, Health key. And what health key health does key. is health key. Yeah. And what health key does is provides you with a portal for employees and they can go in and say, I've got back pain and it'll bring up, here's the solutions for back pain. And, um, here's the, like, here's the services that are on offer. Here's how much it's going to cost. Here's how much the employer is contributing towards this uh um service and how much you need to pay yourself put in your credit card details and pay for it and book your appointment right here so the employer contributes like some of the cost of the treatment the company uh health key makes its money through a uh, revenue split with the the healthcare providers yeah, just a, yeah. mm -hmm. Just just a really great thing. I mean, you've got instant trust for the healthcare providers because your employer is by proxy recommending them. Um, really great for employee engagement. And I saw a group of people going over to him after his pitch to say, you know, hey, look, I want more details. Can we get a demo and I get signed up? Yeah. Uh, you know what? This is actually a really, it's a very simple idea, isn't it? Because you're just clearing out the information and making it very transparent. But interacting with healthcare, no matter what country you're in, I don't care, sort of US, UK, France, whatever, it is, it's just opaque. Like no, people enter it, we don't know who to talk to. We don't know what it's going to cost. We don't know whether it's free. Like we haven't got a clue. Um, and oftentimes, because it's an unprecedented issue, like you might have just injured yourself recently. So you, you haven't got any experience dealing with that issue. Um, so you, you, you're going in with no, no knowledge. Um, so having some tool that can just literally give you the answers, I think absolutely. Um, two minutes I mean, on health key, you know, two minutes on health key versus 25 minutes on Google. Yeah. Yeah. But listen, share the link down there, man. I mean, but happy to, happy to give these guys a plug. I mean, it's a yeah. free plug for them, but yeah, why not? It's a brand, brand, brand new company, but I mean, it's a, it's just, a, it's a marketplace. Really great. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just, yeah, we need transparency in healthcare, man. Go, go, get rid of this back pain. All right. Let's get on with the show. Um, let's talk about quality of hire. Um, um, a quick one. Actually, no, we need to review the newsletter, don't we, real quick? Um, yeah. Did you have a chance to have a, a review of this, mate? Yeah, I've got four. We'll do this one quite quickly because we've got yeah, a lot yeah, to yeah, cover on the show. But I've yeah, got four that we can talk about quite succinctly. For the first time ever, they actually they actually deliberately flow quite nicely. So um, despite like uh, big tech uh, laying off lots of people, it's still hard to hire uh, engineers. It's as hard as it ever has been uh, because most of the people that they um, uh, laid off were not engineers, and um, you know they're they're still in in high demand regardless of what even if they did uh, get laid off. But it was mostly in jobs like um, customer support type jobs and then internal administration, you know, business support jobs. 
HR recruitment, mate. Yeah. H HR recruitment disproportionately affected by tech layoffs. Um, and that totally makes sense, by the way. I know we've made the argument, yeah, you got to keep it TA and all the rest of it. But listen, listen, guys, if you are, if your company has stopped growing and actually you're shrinking, you're cutting staff, there really is no, no reason why TA um, needs to be protected from that. Um, our job is to recruit people and help companies grow. So if they stop growing and they're going to cut, who else are you going to cut in, instead of us? We have, we, we're, we're obviously going to be the ones that have to go. So I think we need to get off that hill. Um, we need to find another way to kind of be valuable. Um, and we talked earlier about intermobility and stuff like this, but you know what we have to expect, um, that, um, companies that are no longer growing and don't expect to grow as fast, they're going to chop us out. Um, and that's a, a great deal of the tech uh, uh, layoffs percentage wise in terms of department have come from TA. OK, yep. quickly, go on. Uh, so not only that, but uh, people in tech have got more opportunity to start their own companies than ever. There's new types of startups emerging uh, and generative AI is helping people build much leaner businesses than before. Uh, I enjoyed reading that essay. And in fact, um, I can tell you that the next business I start, there won't be any more than two of us in the company for the first 12 months because I'm not going to need more than two people to do everything I need to do in that first 12 months. So yeah, um, hear, hear it from the horse's mouth, folks. Uh, Adam, as you, as you might know, uh, is planning to launch a business. I hope, that's not a secret, right? You're going to launch a business in the next I'll, 12 months or so. I'll start, it in, I'll start it in August. Yeah, I, I haven't, right, I haven't so done anything. With, I just, we'll start it in August. Yeah, so the idea is a CEO, experienced CEO of a tech company saying, look, uh, probably an engineer, right? Someone to help build it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's it, because you've got the tools to do everything else. It's going to be crazy. Um, uh, yeah, new world, folks. Uh, smaller companies, leaner companies. Um, go on. Uh, right, Andy Headworth's 12, part, uh, 12 use cases for beginners for ChatGPT. Really great. I can probably... Um, put together a list of about 50 by now because I've been doing a lot of um, focus groups on this subject and uh, yeah. some of the use cases are absolutely amazing. One of the ones that I really, really enjoy is when the hiring manager sends you like basically a like some bullet point crap that doesn't really make much sense for the feedback for the candidates, put it into chat GPT, turn it into some really nice language that's technically sound, but much written much nicer. And then you've got good feedback, you know, things like that. Yeah. So you can basically enhance the feedback, upgrade the feedback to improve the candidate experience. Um, yeah. No question. No question. Um, yep. On that, I'm off to tap your brains on this, by the way, because that's, uh, that's something I might need to present on next week. It'd be interesting to get your, uh, your views on that. Um, yeah. All right. Keep going. On, on that, the final one, um, we, we, we're talking about like jobs which are, let's, let's use the word evolving as a result of um, the common use of generative AI. Customer mm -hmm. support agents, time to performance reduced from six months to two months. Yeah, time to yeah. performance is what I think is potentially a really good way of measuring quality of hire which much smarter than people, people than I are going to come on and talk about. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, that last um, sort of document is really the last last uh, sort of article is really relevant to this conversation. Um, so folks, I don't know whether you know about this um, particular, uh, uh, particular uh, bit of research, but basically it's called generative AI at work. And it's one of the first empirical uh, sort of uh, studies that's been done uh, in the post AI world um, uh, to figure out whether people uh, actually do improve. And it's basically analyzing a, a load of customer service agents. Some of them have got enhanced uh, AI. In other words, they're using chatbots and uh, chat GPT and stuff like this. And others haven't as, 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 a, as a test case. Um, and basically they found that the less skilled, less experienced customer service agents were able to achieve um, a, a very high grade according to the customer's uh, sort of feedback, uh, an equivalent grade to the ones that have been there for much longer and were much more skilled. 
Um, so it's got significant implications to uh, sort of time to productivity, so to speak, which again, gives us a challenge. What does quality of hire mean? If you can layer on some AI on top of it, you know, is everyone, is everyone gonna be great depending on how enhanced they are? Think about that. Um, uh, you know, if you've got someone who's just basically no good at anything, but really good at using generative AI, does that really mean they're good at everything? Um, because actually their output might be. Um, so yeah, gonna be very interesting. Okay, let's get on with the show. Let's bring on, as you say, smarter people than us. Um, because certainly we're all right, Adam. I think we're just above average in terms of IQ. Um, but certainly we're not able to carry the conversation alone um in this particular conversation. So let's bring on some smaller cats uh, to help us with this. Um we should have uh Chantel. Let's bring on Chantel. Um, there is only one Chantel, of course. We'll bring on Chloe as well, if she's there. Chloe Morrison. Oh, I'm sure yeah, I Chloe. saw Chloe. Chloe's definitely there. Yeah, no. How do you spell Chloe? C H L O E. Oh, yeah, she is. Oh, she's actually spelt it with an accent. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. I'm actually not sure whether um <clears throat> sort of Crowcat understands accents on this. Um Okay, uh, let me just get Andrew. Is he there? He is. Oh, there's Chantel. Hey. Great to see you, Chantel. Well, Chloe's brought a plus one. Time. Yeah, when you said I brought a smart cash. <laughs> okay, we're going to bring on... Oh, we, you, we, we have animals as well. Always a positive <laughs> thing. Um, we've, we'll bring on Andrew GPT. and Rob as well. All right, listen, let's uh, let's do some intros. Um, Chantel, as you were on screen first, why don't you introduce yourself real quick? Who are you? What it is you do? Uh, my name is Chantel. Very kind of Adam to say smart people. I, I wouldn't put myself in that category, but I've been lucky to work in recruitment for 13 years. So I've been around the block and seen lots of things. I now create recruitment programs for the startup and scale up space. So very fortunate to play with new initiatives in, in the talent space. Fantastic. Great to see you here, uh, Chantel. Uh, Chloe, great to see you as well. Uh, why don't you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Hi, everybody. I'm Chloe. Uh, I'm currently a program manager for recruiting operations in uh, Datadog. I've been recruiting for 13 years as well as Chantal. So we've been here for a while. And my cat has decided that she wants to be on my desk today. So I hope she brings loads of great points. Not, not getting rid of any cat, right? The cat stays on screen all the way through. Um, okay, let's bring, let's welcome Rob McIntosh, the great Rob McIntosh. First time on the show, a debutante. Uh, Rob, great to see you, man. Um, can you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Oh, Can't he's get... muted. Yeah. Rob, I'm sorry, man. You're muted, dude. Oh, I, I think he can't come on. Um, can't hear anything. Oh, that's a shame. Uh, well, listen, you have to fill it with that, Rob. Let me just get on. Let's let's introduce Andrew now. Uh, Andrew, uh, can you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Sure, I, you can hear me, right? So that works. Yeah, no okay. problem. Yeah, so one up on we're all one up on Rob. Um, my name is Andrew Gadomsky. Uh, I'm a operations research senior analyst uh, for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, within the Department of Homeland Security of the U.S. federal government. Uh, my job is to analyze the workforce, uh, the cyber work, uh, specifically the cyber and infrastructure workforce that protects 330 million Americans uh, and analyze uh, everything from where we get them to how we retain them and how we train them. And so happy to be here. Great to have you on, Andrew, and thanks for going. We've jumped through some hoops, haven't we, to get you there. So fantastic to see you uh, on the show. Um, okay, let's get on with this topic. The reason why all of us here have been basically um, gathered together is because all of you were involved in that that sort of massive conversation we were having online, um, uh, where I think Rob's come back. Rob, I think we can yeah. hear you. Yeah, guys, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Great. Um, Rob, do you quickly introduce hey, yourself? <laughs> yeah, don't... Bluetooth, man. Um, hey, everyone. Rob McIntosh. I'm the VP of uh, Recruiting Solutions for PSG Global Solutions. Um, looking forward to this chat because, as I said to Hung prior to this, I'm probably the one dissenter on the call. No, I, well, you you had some amazing commentary on this post. Now, I want people to fish this out and have a look at it. I don't know whether I, I pulled it out, but so many people commented on it, and all four of you basically had some really interesting observations to make. Let me just lay out the land in terms of you know where we where I started with it, and we'll, we'll then sort of uh, go with your commentary. So, essentially, quality of hire is something we care about. 
Um, we don't do it enough in the TA space. We don't understand the, the, the metric. We don't know how to measure it. Basically, it was the company Screen Loop, I think, came out with a guide. Um, and like everyone wanted the guide. Um, so this is my this is my sort of little signal to say, right, recruiters care about this because so many people were interested in securing this uh, this document, which you should download, by the way. Download it for free. Anyway, uh, first thing that basically they said was that, OK, you need to. Um, uh, you need to separate quality of application from quality of hire. Um, so the different metrics, don't conflate them. You need to be more defined with your understanding as to what quality of hire means. Like, for instance, as recruiters, we often think, yeah, our quality is great. How do we know that? Because, you know, what the, the, the hiring managers uh, interviewed them or the hiring managers hired them. That's actually not a quality of hire metric because you don't know whether they've actually performed in the job down the track. So you have to connect the information that we've collected, which is all of the assessment data and all of the, uh, the recruitment data pre-hire with the performance data post-hire. And this is probably where we break down because obviously we can see the responsibility might then migrate to ta talent management or HR or somebody else that isn't what we do. So there was a strong argument, I think. I think actually, uh, Andrew, you might have made this case. I think Tim Sackett certainly did, where he said, you know what, it's not our job. Um, it's actually HR's job. What we need to do is work better with HR. But there's a, pot a potential sort of angle to that as well. Okay. We also, uh, just a final uh, lay of the land kind of stuff, but we also need to basically create some quantification on this. We can't just say that was great, great candidate. We need to have some way in which we're translating, um, basically creating a scorecard at the assessment phase that is also mapped to some scorecard at the performance phase. So this is an idea of simply getting the, uh, the right language together so that we can map against, okay, uh, we rated this person at this number when we, ha when we offered them, they actually performed at that number uh, six to 12 months, 18 months down the line. Therefore, maybe we need, we need to feed this back and understand what we're uh, rating for at the beginning. Isn't that accurate? We need to update. So we need some sort of feedback loop to inform recruitment decisions. Anyway, that is the lay of the land as far as I understood this guide. Um, so let's get into it now and talk to some of our uh, friends here and figure out what we think. Um, Chloe, let's go with you first because your your comment was one of the funniest um, in the sense that apparently you had some research experience looking at professional sports and stuff. And I know the like the NFL draft has recently just concluded, hasn't it? Um, and so it's quite topical. So I wonder whether you could give us some context there. Like what was that comment about? What's the research uh, associated with that? And how does it apply to, to, to our work in recruiting? Sure. So that was in my previous job. Um, I was tasked to basically hire people that were a clone of our top performers. All right. So that sounds great in theory. Uh, how do you do that? So I tried to look at what that person was doing. And I was like, they seem great. I can't reproduce that. Um, so I actually uh, did a course on Coursera. It's called People Analytics. I can drop the link in, in the chat. It was really good. And that taught me a lot of stuff about statistics. But what was really interesting was the comparison that they were doing uh, with the NFL. I know nothing about the NFL. I'm not even sure what it stands for. But basically, when uh, they scout the, the players, uh, those players are doing great things, touching the balls, scoring things, I don't know what. Um, but then they hire them, right? And if they bring them onto the field in their new club, and they don't give them the same opportunities, uh, they don't put them on the field as often as they were in the previous club, then they're not going to perform as much, right? And that was basically one of the things that I could see in the team that I was recruiting for because we're only recruiters and some teams were very established and some not. Okay, I think this is a really good point. And I, I, do, I do want to jump in here just to underline to the audience why this is a super important point. Have you not been told as a recruiter, hey, I want more of this guy or I want more of that candidate? You know, hey, get someone like uh, Chantel. She's amazing. That's like the classic re requisition thing that gets thrown over, right? Has Everyone's had this. Um, and you think, all right, great. I'm just going to get an identical person uh, to try and find this. Well, what are the signals that this person, oh, from this university, uh, speaks with that accent, looks like this or whatever. And we go hunting around for this uh, uh, this person. And lo and behold, 
this person doesn't necessarily perform because the context is different. And I think that's that's the thing you, that's important with this example. You're you're, uh, you're taking someone out of a context, putting them into a new context, and then we're suddenly surprised uh, that performance levels um, are the same or aren't the same. Um, so that's a really important thing. Uh, a human performance is probably not consistent. Um, it's contextual. Um, we're, we're not walking around as quality candidates full stop. Um, you can drop any sort of person in the wrong situation and they're not going to perform. Uh, and in fact, a non-performer today, probably you could pull that person out and drop them into another context and they might actually be better. Um, so I think apart from there may be a small percentage that are always going to be great no matter what context, there might be a small percentage that are always going to be bad no matter what context, but I think the vast majority of humanity probably sits in that middle bracket. And that's something we have to understand with quality of heart. Okay, any thoughts on this? Let's bring uh, you in, Andrew. You're an American. Uh, we, th we talked about sort of NFL there. Um, does this kind of resonate with you in the sense of, you know what, hey, uh, you know, hire someone like this. Um, and in fact, actually, you're not applying sort of any type of understanding as to why that individual performed well. It's not, it, you're just looking for similarities that you think actually would translate. It, it's it's funny that, that, that she mentioned uh, the NFL. I actually looked up, Prior to taking this, I, I looked at, did I write anything on quality of hire in the archives? And I wrote something uh, in 2013 that uses the quarterback passing rating uh, of the NFL to execute quality of hire. Um, but it's not, it has nothing to do with um, using recruitment data or pre-employment data as, as a gauge for the quality of hire. That's the position of CISA, that's the position of the Department of Homeland Security. We do not use any such data to indicate or forecast whether or not someone will do well in the organization. What we focus on is um, there's an expectation of performance. We assess that, we assess whether or not that person can do the work using any number of validated assessments. But then once they're here and they have all the resources available to them, are they performing as expected? And there's a series of metrics that we can use um, and there's an ISO standard that helps us do that. But, you know, you know, Tom Brady was like, he was not a number one draft pick. Okay. He was, <laughs> he was like ninth round. And you know, I don't know if that's accurate, but I think it was ninth round. And he's the greatest of all time in the NFL. So. Do you know what? I think sports is actually a really good example, isn't it? Anybody who's a team sports fan would recognize this when, you know, a new player, a star player joins your team. They were amazing before and suddenly they're terrible now. Um, why is that? Are, are they suddenly, did you get your scouting wrong or did you kind of lack, did you fail to understand the context of this person performing? Um, and maybe, I mean, again, it's no longer like a, a cool thing to say, but it is about fit, right? Is this person fitting in with how you actually operate as a team? Um, and again, uh, it, it really challenges how we do the assessment because we treat assessments as like a solo thing. Um, whereas in fact, collaborative work, um, generally speaking, you're interacting with other people. Maybe it's an angle to talk about. Um, okay. Um, Rob, I'm going to bring you in at the end because you, you've self-identified as a, as a dissenter. So I want to uh, bring, bring on other people first and then have you dissent on us. That's, um, that's it. I think that's your, that's your role today. Um, uh, okay, um, Chantel, let's go to you on this. Um, I mean, I, I guess you, you, you've kind of worked, obviously, as a recruiter. You've, you've, you've kind of hired people in this regard. Also, you've, you've, you've got this kind of new role within uh, Nash Squared. So... Tell us what your thoughts are on, on quality of hire, both internally and, and whether you, you've ever advised anybody or, or, or recommended how, how TA teams can uh, start implementing and oper operationalizing this. Yes, most definitely. So it's something that I would say I'm very um, passionate about encouraging TA teams to get involved with, but I do agree with some of the conversation going around that it needs to be probably like a committee effort to really drive and adopt this. So it should probably be HR, TA and hiring managers, in, in my opinion, because we all get something out from it, even though we can't be so responsible for actually the performance after the hire. So this is a conversation that we've been having for the last year or so with like our startup and scale up portfolio. Um, what we've actually begun with is taking that first TA bit in making that scalable and measurable so that when it does come to, to looking at quality of hire, we do have a scorecard that kind of 
should complement. So that's been a lot of the work that we've been doing. And what we, what I've seen personally is leadership haven't necessarily, they, they understand the importance of it, aren't having it as a priority to really drive it through. So we're almost breadcrumbing our way to get to quality of hire with our portfolio. So we're starting with making sure that actually the recruitment process is scalable and measurable and moving away from gut fill. Um, and that's where we use, we create scorecards um, to kind of identify behavior and traits. Completely agree with you, Hung, that performance is environmental. Um, and Chloe, like your sports analogy is great for that. Um, what traits and behaviors indicate success might work in one business, not, not another. So it's trying to understand your own environment first and then creating a scorecard around that so you can assess people coming in the door. Um, and then the second part of our journey is then coming later down the line of, is this a quality hire? Because that will then help us in turn. It's a, it's a positive feedback loop, um, but it's one that we're at our embryonic start of the journey. Is that, I mean, I'm, I'm very sympathetic with that view because, you know, I'm, I, I, I kind of lean towards the idea that most implementation should be kind of emergent from the from your own company rather than just like imported in from outside. Uh, but at the same time, Andrew mentioned there was an ISO standard out there. So are, are we at risk of just reinventing the wheel unnecessarily here? Is it possible that someone's already figured out some of the main bits of work, the framework that we can deploy in? Um, do you want to just tell us quickly about this, um, Andrew, before we bring Rob into the conversation? Sure. So uh, the standard is actually uh, five years old. Uh, so uh, if you were look it up, ISO slash TS uh, 3411, uh, what it basically says is that an organization set or an organization sets an expectation of what performance should be for an individual, uh, a group of individuals or a division, and then did they meet? Uh, did they meet the goals and objectives and the performance that was expected uh, over a period of time? It's not necessarily is Chloe, Adam, Rob, etc. doing well. It's did the business, did the organization perform as it was expected with the people who were on the team? And it lets the organization determine what those factors are and then execute a weighting system. So they can measure quality of hire based on the performance of the individual or the team. And so it, it gives you the, the framework to plug in what you believe is correct. And so in an organization that's in software technology and maybe they're at a mature stage and they've already been invested in their primary concerns, maybe around product development updates and customer retention. And so they're hiring customer support personnel uh, and engineering personnel, and then they're measuring quality higher on based on customer retention and so on. While an organization that's in a startup mode might be not looking at, they, they may not be able to afford a lot more people, but what they're looking at is revenue per employee. They're looking at the ability to acquire new, new customers and then have them expand. And then those are the performance metrics that come into is this group, is this individual increasing the quality and the value uh, of themselves and then of the outputs of the organization? That's what the standard does. It allows the, it allows you to have a framework and then adjust that framework over time. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot more than now that you've explained it to me, Andrew, because basically the connection with the business objective, the connection with the maturity of the organization, um, and it gives you, it kind of maps it back to the stuff the company cares about. It's not about what you know TA cares about. It's what the what the business value is, because uh, all of these metrics are meaningless without uh, without that uh, connection. Um, Rob, thanks for being patient with us, man. Uh, let's bring you into it. And I, get, I I joked about you playing a role of being the bad guy here. That's not the case. Um, but you did have some really interesting insights. Uh, some of your commentary, I think in that post was the uh, the, the most thoughtful uh, that we had. Now I'll share that post with everyone uh, in a moment. Um, give us your take on this, uh, Rob. What's your view on quality of hire? Where does this sit? Who should do it? Yeah, so for context for everyone, it was basically the 10 year anniversary of me presenting at ERE San Diego, where I spent two years of my life building a framework for improving and measuring and scorecards for quality of hire. And the backstory here be relevant for everyone to understand is 
when I was the head of TA for Avenard, which is a joint venture between Microsoft and Accenture, my boss, the CHRO said, okay, Rob, you've helped us fix cost and you've helped us fix speed. Now go and help us fix quality. And at that time, I was like, you're kidding? What quality? I don't, it's a holy grail. It's a unicorn. So I went and did some research online and I'm not going to name the person publicly, but a very well-known thought leader had published an article like you published yours, Pung, where it basically laid out, oh yeah, to go do quality or hire, you need to go look at these seven things and then you divide those seven things by the N variable and then you get a percentage score. And I went, oh, okay, great. I've got you know a model to go do that. So I went ahead and looked at all the data previously at the past two years for all these data points that we've been collecting anyway. And we came up with a scorecard and quality higher measurements and all the rest. And Adam, I didn't want to put the link in this because I was worried I'd derail everyone going and looking at this presentation. But if you want at the end, it's on slide share and you guys can share it if you want. So uh, do, we, do, do we want to see Rob's presentation? Yes, no. Let me know in the comments, folks. Go ahead. So Hung, this is the thing that I thought was really interesting. So the data points that that we used were things like performance ratings of new hires, right? And we used hiring manager survey satisfaction on their new hires. And we used attrition as a data point as well. And we went and ran all this data and, and some of the stuff's redacted because it was real live Avenar data that's in these scorecards that you'll see in the deck. Um, we could never get the score greater than the low 80s, and we could never get the score lower than the low 60s. And it just was killing us to work out why can't we actually produce a quality of higher output using these indicators? Well, lo and behold, after months and months of going back and forth, thinking through this, we came to the conclusion, which if you've worked in an enterprise or an SMB business, right, that has a performance management framework, and also has compensation that is tied to people's performance, which is then distributed, then you'll understand and you'll go, oh, sh yeah, that makes perfect sense. What happens is how money gets distributed for bonuses, annual performance bonuses and merit increases is derived at the highest level of the organization, the CFO, CEO, and they push down who can get what bonuses within each of those business units, right? So as a manager or a VP in that business unit, when I'm distributing performance merit bonuses, I've got a whole bunch of people that I've got to distribute that to. You can't give everyone, like if the scoring of performance is out of five, you can't give everyone a five out of five, for the highest end of performance, because you financially couldn't afford to do that in an organization for all of those groups. So what happens by default, and a lot of you guys will probably nod your head and go, I've seen that firsthand too, Generally, new hires by default get shoved in the middle of the bell curve. So out of five, they get stuck into three. So that then means from a performance management standpoint, their merit increase is in the middle distribution versus the people and tenured people are generally higher distribution. You get the gist of that's how organizations generally do performance bonuses and all the rest. Well, what happens is if you understand that the middle of the bell curve data point related to first year employee performance is stuck in the middle of the bell curve because that was one of the indicators in the four things divided by you know individual data points i talked about it it basically compressed every business unit and every part of that organization to never be able to go higher than 80 something percent in the quality of high score or lower than 60 something percent because all the new hires were getting shoved in the middle of the bill curve, which compressed the problem. So you get the gist. So, so the final why, point. Why were why were the new hires um, shoved into the middle of this bell curve? Uh, 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 Rob, quick theory on that. Because of distribution of performance bonuses and scores. So the score that you get as a new hire, generally, when we looked at the data and we pulled it apart, all new hires on the whole, we're getting shoved into the middle of the distribution bell curve of a score of three out of five. Because because that's how we rate things? because uh, Or is it because it's attached to a compensation value? Yes, which, which basically, so Because yeah. 
a, a business unit person has so much funds that they can distribute their performance bonuses within their group, they can't give everyone fives out of five in this example, because mm -hmm. you financially couldn't afford to do that. Yep. So by default, you they were just getting put into the middle or the lower end of the distribution curve because they were new. Yeah, very interesting. Oh, quick, quick segue, Hans, by the a, way. Just a comment on that. It, this is a common misstep that I think people use with data. And it wasn't a misstep that, that Rob's team did. The data is not very big. You know, we're not talking about millions or, or, or tens of millions of data points, whether you're a million people in an organization or 5,000 or 500. What, what tends to occur is when you have these kinds of things happen with low volume data, you do what's called overfitting. And so what ends up happening is you're taking everything and you're putting it together into Rob's point because it was so much normalized data. You can't really understand why things are working the way they're working. And so your output isn't a representative sample. And so what, what data scientists do is they do what are called holdbacks. So in this example, when, when I've done quality of hire analysis, I'll throw out all the new hires or people who have only been on for 18 months or don't have performance reviews greater than say six or less than six performance reviews. So as you're thinking about doing these kinds of things, you have to also take the science and then say, let's not drive directly to a normal distribution and see if something comes up. I think I think Rob's team did a really nice job discovering that, wow, this is exactly what's happening. So well, one th I want to make sure hung this point, because if everyone who joined this call doesn't hear this one last thing, then it's a gotcha. The whole reason I reached out to Hung was I said, what was published? And I'm not throwing that individual vendor marketing because I see this all the time in the last 10 years. Someone decides to push out a marketing document that comes up with this fancy formula of use all these data points and divide it by the number of variables. And voila, you've got your easy button quality of hire score. The problem with that is that it happened to me and it took me two years of my freaking life to fix that. And what I don't want people to do is blindly believe that all these articles that get pushed out there, that it, actually they know the real answer unless you've lived in the role like a TA leader and pulled all this stuff apart to try and work out what works and what doesn't. Everything in the depth that I say, measure it individually. But when you start combining all these things to Andrew's point and then try and come up with an easy button fanciful one answer quality a high score you are doomed uh, do rob it. listen um uh, firstly i really appreciate you coming in uh, so basically rob and i had a dialogue sort of on dm after we had that sort of public conversation. So i really appreciate you coming in um and sharing your experience there by the way the three things i want to deal with real quick number one we have like zillions of people is like saying yes send the deck so if you still have that right, link you you share it Brilliant. Now that now I'm talking, I'll shut up and it's in the chat window for everyone. Everybody download that because we need to have a look at it. The second thing that was a really interesting point was just basically how the influence of budget and compensation influences up uh, how we actually rate people. Um, so, so that in itself is a separate issue because it's about budget that's separate um, and based on business performance, right? So the business is absolutely doing amazing. Guess what? There's going to be massive disbursement of, 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 of some of that profit compared to a company that's actually not doing so great. You might still have great individual performers in a company that's not doing great, but they would not be compensated in the same, the same way. And if your method of compensation is tied to performance, then they're going to be ranked down. Third thing that's really interesting is just the natural human psychology of giving people a rating. We are really adverse to giving people extraordinarily sort of high ratings and extraordinarily bad ratings. I think Uber did a really interesting bit of research on what the average score a consumer gives a driver. And it is higher than normal. It's higher than a random sort of number. It's something like 3.5 to 4. So in other words, most people who basically have an Uber and they have an okay experience, they feel obliged to just give this person a, a, a higher the, so than average rating so that their drive doesn't get penalized. We rarely go to zero or one or something like that unless we've had a desperately poor experience and we want to harm this person. Um, most people who have had a suboptimal experience, let's say, on Uber, simply walk away and say, okay, fine, let it slide. 
Um, so we always rank things 3.5 plus. Um, so whenever you see any rating on anything that's out there, unless the person is carrying a vendetta, it will never drift to what the true assessment of that experience might be. Uh, so that's something that we need to be aware of as well. The third point I've totally forgotten, but it'll come back to me. But now it is something that we always need to do in the middle of every show because uh, we only have 15 minutes left, folks. Um, and we want to make sure that we uh, continue this conversation, even though Brain Food Live on air does have to come off air uh, at some point. Um, so if you're interested in this conversation, everybody, uh, now is the moment to just make sure you're connected with everyone who's also interested in this conversation so you can continue it after we come off air. Uh, so take a moment, take your LinkedIn profile, share it in the chat stream, or if you're watching this on any of the LinkedIn's uh, that's currently broadcasting this, take your LinkedIn profile, share it in the comment thread, and then just basically connect with everyone who's done the same. Um, I had I went to a party yesterday, never go to parties, but I went to a party yesterday, um, and uh, a, a friend of mine, or somebody came up to me, wasn't even a friend, but he's a friend now, they said, yeah, hung, I love the, the Brain Food Lives, I, I always get like 50 new connections from there. I'm thinking, yeah, that's great. Um, go and get some connections, improve your network. These are all smart people that care about recruiting. They'll be watching it. They won't be watching a live stream on Friday afternoon or Friday morning, unless that was the case. Um, okay. Uh, Rob, I'm going to stay with you on this next point. Um, because, um, obviously you went through a very, um, difficult, uh, sort of exercise and you managed to produce great insight for us. Um, what is your perspective now on quality of hire? Are you at the position where it's just too big a beast to handle? Or do, is there some sort of heuristic or some sort of thing um, that somebody out there can use um, uh, to operationalize? Because what I anticipate is that CEO out there might be saying to some TA guys, hey, listen, can you do quality of hire? Same conversation they gave to you uh, uh, those 10 years or so ago. Do you have uh, any uh, recommendations for that person other than, you know, potentially refusing uh, the, uh, the, the the task? Yes. So what I want to be clear is I'm not saying don't try and measure quality of hire. It's there's a couple of things that I learned and takeaways and I'm happy to share. So Chantal actually said something really interesting, which is really important. You have to get everyone on the same page of what is the definition of quality of hire in your own organization. And I was telling Andrew this actually last week in a conversation. When I did this at Avenard and I originally went round, I, I had business leaders all around the world come up with like 27 different descriptions of what they thought quality of hire was. So the first, the first part of the journey was everyone had to align and agree. And we agreed that we wanted to improve attrition for the first 12 months of employment. That was how we were gonna measure as the, we'll call it the North Star of quality of heart. So that's the first thing. The second thing I think today that you could probably, if I had to do it again, I'm gonna have way more access to tools and probably insights on how to look at data that I couldn't have done 10 years ago to Andrew's point. Now I'm not saying chat GPT, cause that's just, everyone's talking about chat GPT. Let's just say in general, I think AI going forward in some degree should have a role to play in, in what I've seen in some presentations of where you tell it, you give it the data set and you give it a directional understanding of give me the insights that you find in the data set. It might uncover things that we've never thought about before. Um, so I'm very bullish on that. And the final takeaway, once again, sounding like a broken record, measure all these things individually. Don't lump them all together and try and produce one outcome as a 83% quality or higher score. It just, it's bound to cause you a lot of pain. What do you mean by, uh, what do you mean by measuring individually, Rob? How can you help me visualize this? Um, because yeah, I think a lot of people are thinking, go on. Yeah. So go measure first year employee performance individually, go measure employee turnover, go measure hiring manager satisfaction, go measure them all individually and maybe draw some conclusions on how you can shift behavior. So back to the point of, you know, Chloe finding that North star, we actually then developed a very robust competency behavioral framework on high performing employees for that Avenard core competencies. And we embedded that into our interviewing and assessment framework going forward. And we made a very structured interview format and template and scoring system because we found out the higher performing or the employees that stayed longer seem to produce better outcomes on our core 
competencies and behaviors. So before it was a bit of a haphazard, hiring managers would ask their own special how many you know, people on board could sit in a 747 jet and all that type of stuff, where we, it, we basically enforced that everyone must ask these core competency behavioral questions in a structured interviewing format. And that's how we started to see shifts in attrition in the first 12 months of employment. I even went so far that I put all the competencies and behaviors at Avenard and what does great look like on our careers page. People thought I was nuts when I when I first decided to do that. Like you're giving them the answers to the test. I'm like, no, it's not a test. We want to hire more of those type of people. So that's where I think doing it individually will then help you understand what are the levers you can pull. But if you lump, if I lumped that all together again, I would have been lost trying to work out where the problems were. Right. So, so basically, just for the audience here, as I understand it, Adam, I'll bring you in a sec. Uh, this, and I'm blaming the CEO here, the mythical CEO who hasn't contributed to this conversation whatsoever. So I've just created this hor horrific monster. But let's imagine this CEO is going to come in and say, I want a number because they want to have a simple dashboard. Um, we have to kind of be careful with that because we, we basically think that there's someone being arrested. Yeah, um, Rob's getting arrested because of all the points he just made about quality of hire. It's, it's, someone's being arrested here. I thought uh, usually that's me because I live in like, quite a high high crime high crime area. But no, so, it's somebody so else. Just on that, that point to ground everyone in the deck. I'm just looking at this now. On slide 26, you will see basically five six individual scorecards individually presented. Not what I originally had was this one big Uber scorecard with one data point that was wrong. So I yeah. still do scorecards and I did scorecards and I showed directional improvement in the, you know, over time and all that stuff. But I, I had to break them out as five, six, seven different individual scorecards. Yeah, I totally get what you're saying. Basically, we need a bit more complexity that, that we, and resist the sense to simpl overly simplify something which is inevitably complex. Um, so this is a this is I think this will equip you us to have conversations internally about it um, uh, with uh, with the C level. Okay, folks, let's switch tasks just a little bit um, and, and think about how do we operationalize the concept. I think a lot of people the reason why they're interested in this is because they haven't done anything on quality of hire beyond let's say the classic how long has that person been in the job? Uh, oh, they've stayed for more than a year, therefore they're great. We, we kind of have yes, it's kind of one indication. Um, but we, you know, in the sense that a spectacularly bad hire, probably the company would need to move that person on after a year. But are we really hiring great people? Because there's a lot of, lot of times we get someone in who, you know, is a mediocre performer, even slightly below average. But you know what? You know, we haven't moved that person on for whatever reason. We just hired someone else to backfill, etc. Um, what other measures can we, we kind of use? Uh, folks, if you have any questions, by the way, for the, for the, or for the panel, make sure you use the ask a question feature at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Let's go around on this quality of hire. Um, um, Andrew, uh, do you want to give us, like, how do we operationalize this? You're talking to a person who's a new head of TA, never done it in their business before. What, what does this person need to do? So what we'll do with the agency is, is we understand what are the work roles or what are the positions that are the most critical of nature, that if we had vacancy that was greater than, say, 90 to 120 days, it exhibits a lot of risk for the nation. So we have all these partners at in, in cities and counties and tribal nations and so on that they're vulnerable to domestic and international attack. Uh, our dam structures, our chemical sector, uh, the colonial pipeline and cybersecurity. So we need to have certain people in certain roles. And if they're not occupied, it is absolutely a higher risk scenario for the organization. So the one that I would say is, figure out what are your critical roles inside the organization that you cannot go without and measure that occupancy is there. You always have someone in that job 365 days a year, measure the percentage of how long it's occupied, regardless of their tenure. Because the assumption you're making is you did a good job assessing that person and that person is de is de-risking the organization and the stakeholders you have. Okay, so basically there needs to be an internal analysis of in terms of role prioritization, basically. Um, right. So it it's, may be it's, one not, of these... it's not 100% of your roles. You can't say everybody is absolutely critical, but there are jobs that you have that if you didn't have someone in that job, 
you have a compliance problem, you have an auditing problem, you have a safety problem back to your employees, you've got threats. I mean, so think about that, make sure that those are occupied. And then you can start talking about, we're doing a pretty good job in the hiring. We've got high quality people. How come? Because we don't have, because our risk is, is, is low. All right. So I think that's actually a useful technique to use if it is a, a kind of, I wouldn't say a secret, but a, a, a conversation that isn't necessarily company wide within the organization. What I anticipate being the case is that the CEO, again, mythical CEO might say, we want to like quality of hire across the board, Mr. Recruiter or Mrs. Recruiter. Can you give us something? And for us to segment stuff might be politically difficult to do. However, I think the first thing to do is probably to do some analysis as to which are the most critical roles and make sure that's something that we get right first. Um, yeah. So I think that's a good step. Localize, uh, it. Localize it to 50 team members, pick a handful that in this 50, in this 50 to 100 people, we've got some critical roles and then go ahead and execute that everywhere, have the right dialogues. That's my, that's my suggestion on where you get started where we get started, basically critical roles. I think that's a sensible first step. Okay, let's go to you, Chantel. What are your thoughts on this? Advice to a, a, a person that's doing this for the first time. What a way to follow up. Um, just a quick one, Hung, to your point about people constantly scoring 3.5s, threes. If people are finding that, I would create stronger definitions behind each point, just so that you come away from three 3.5s. Just a, a side note. Um, where to go from that? My, I, I was getting a lot more operational focus than, than Andrew's um, articulate answer there. So for me, it, it's it, it's getting leadership buy-in first to actually have this. I know Mr. CEO has said he wants it, but actually there is a C-suite and there are other big influencers that need to get buy-in with this. Um, from there, I totally agree with Rob's point, do some internal analysis silo to see where those dark points are. And then for me, I really would focus on getting a committee of people who have influence within the business, within each function. So hiring managers, HR, TA, um, and that would be kind of my first go to steps. Yeah, basically recruit some allies and sponsors at the top level. And by the way, that can also include include recruiters. I think one of the but probably a metric that recruiters might resist would be quality of hire. Um, I mean, some of the commentary that we had on the post was exactly this, uh, where people said, you know what, it's not our bag because, you know, what if the hiring manager is terrible? We've done our great job recruiting these, this talented person. Hiring managers messed this up because he or she has been a, a terrible, you know, people person. Um, so it might be that we also need to work internally with the, the TA function to say, you know what, uh, this is the reason why we need to care about it. Uh, Chloe, let's go to you on this. Um, what's what's a, a one piece of advice you'd give to someone trying this for the first time? Um, you need a big sample of people. That's the first thing that I learned. Small sample won't give you any results. Mm -hmm. And you need to split your data by teams because one team may have like a time to performance that is really quick. Some people might have a really long one and you can't compare apples and oranges, basically. Really, really great point, folks. Uh, some jobs are harder. <laughs> we have to say this, right? Some jobs are like just simply harder to do and it takes longer time to, to ramp up. Uh, other jobs are really quick. And by the way, AI might help with this, um, or it might even confuse it because let's say you, someone comes in and actually a job is particularly AIable, then presumably they will get more higher productivity if you were able to implement that technology. And in fact, that would confuse the matter compared to a job or a job role that was actually resistant uh, to uh, AI support. Um, it doesn't mean the person's any worse a person or the quality of hires any less. It's simply a different job function. So you need to analyze job difficulty, let's say, or, you know, how quick to performance do we expect someone to um, get? There's a final point for everyone that, that what I learned really quickly, anytime that you can tie your initiative to the financials of the organization, where you start to use the language of the CFO and the CEO, no. oh my goodness, how quickly you get people to rally behind the cause. So on slide eight of nine, I was saying, I'm just looking at this, we did some financial modeling we worked out a shift in attrition, positive shift in attrition in first you know, 12 months by 4.2% 4, 4 actually saved the company $40 million. Wow. It's very, it's very easy to find yeah, yeah, yeah. when the numbers, pay, and that was only like 
330 odd people in the organization difference. It was $40 million. Yeah. We, we work directly with the office of the chief financial officer yeah. on the same thing, understanding what is our actual spend uh, on individuals versus the budgeted uh, that Congress and the president have executed against. Congress wants to know how we're doing about that. We have to make sure that we're staying occupied and that the right people in the right place at the right time. And then they ask us, do we have the right people? And, and if we say we do, we've assessed them fairly, they're executing the performance that they do. And then they say, did you spend the money that we gave you and are we on budget? And if the short answer is yes, you got a pretty happy country. Yeah, you need to basically speak. And uh, by the way, we're coming to the end of this show. Adam, I know you got to bounce, so go and get your kids. Um, uh, Rob, thank you for your final point there. Um, I think this, I mean, again, this we probably need to do a deeper dive into this. I've got tons of people saying, where is the slide deck? Uh, the, folks, um, it, it's a shed on, on Crowdcast, but I will share it with you on the LinkedIn thread that where you're watching this um, so you can get a hold of this document. Uh, so I think it's certainly worth worth reviewing. Okay, folks, we have to bring it to an end. Let's thank our guests here. Thank you very much, Chantel. Great to see you. Uh, great to see you as well, Chloe. What's the name of your cat, my dear? Um, Sabrina. <laughs> great to see Sabrina on screen. Uh, Andrew, wonderful to have you on the show as usual. Thank you so much for your erudition. Um, and Rob, thank you so much for your contribution here, sir. Really appreciate you dropping in. I hope you've enjoyed your debut on Brain Food Live. Um, okay, Adam, why are you still here? Go and get your kids. Go and get yeah, your kids. Look, I, was just, I was just going to say one last thing, but Rob, Rob basically said it. it it's, the reason it's so important to us in talent acquisition is because this is what justifies our business plan. So, you know, if we're able to say to the CEO that we've helped achieve 3% increase in profitability rather than 20% reduction in time to hire or whatever it might be, then we get taken a lot more seriously. Yeah, we need to get away from basically HRTA specific uh, metrics that we care about. Uh, I don't think we get rid of them. We care about them. But you know what? We need to align very much with what the business cares about first. OK, that's about it. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good weekend. Thank you to our guests. Um, we'll uh, we'll catch up with you guys um, in due course. Um, and yeah, I guess that's the end of the show. So uh, thanks, everybody. Um, Right. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I certainly did. It was a, what a wonderful show that was. Um, okay. Um, have a good weekend, everybody. Thanks to everyone who helped live stream that in different places as well, by the way. Really, really good to do. Um, we'll be back next week as usual. If you enjoyed the show, by the way, follow the channel on Crowdcast. That's basically where uh, you get all the great chat and the link shares and stuff like this. Do this show every Friday. Um, next week, I will be in Amsterdam. Um, and I will be, uh, we'll be talking about skills-based hiring. How do we move to skills-based hiring, folks? Everyone talks about it, but do we actually know how to do it? Um, uh, we've got some wonderful guests to join us for that. Um, so if you're interested in another interesting angle on how to do the recruitment job, make sure you register for that show. Okay, that's about it. See you next week. Thanks for watching.